Welcome everyone. This is the fifth and final day of our CEPR Economic Summit, and I can't get over how quickly this week has gone by. If you've missed any of the sessions or want to share them with friends and colleagues, you'll find video recordings of all the main panels and discussions and speakers on our website at cper.stanford.edu. For anyone who's joining us for the first time this week, I'm Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and I'm incredibly grateful for your participation in the summit and your support of our mission at CEPR to catalyze and promote research that is meant to have a direct impact on economic policymaking. I'm thrilled to be closing this week with a keynote address from Rafael Bostic. Rafael is the president of the Federal Reserve Bank in Atlanta, and there's so much ground we can cover in our conversation that will follow his presentation. And I'm also really looking forward to the questions that you'll be able to send in through the link that should be on your screens. Rafael has been serving as the 15th president and CEO of the Atlanta Fed since June of 2017. He oversees the bank's monetary policy, bank supervision, and regulation and payment services. He's a participant on the Fed's Open Market Committee. Before running the Atlanta Fed, Rafael was a department chair and professor at the Seoul Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. He also was the Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development between 2009 and 2012, and worked at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors before that as an economist and then a senior economist in the Monetary and Financial Studies section. Of course, the most important part of his career was getting his PhD in economics here at Stanford. I can go on and on about his career in academia and in public service along with his many accomplishments, but I think we're all eager to hear what Rafael has to say about the state of the economy and where he sees things going after a very devastating year during the past year. So let me turn things over to you, President Bostic, uh, Raf, Raf, and I hope you've got some good news for us. Uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Mark. It's really good to see you, and it's good to be here. It's good to be able to, to be part of this summit. This is uh, uh, one of the things that I, you know, CEPR, I actually really appreciated uh, the support they gave me as a student and the insights and opportunities that I got. Uh, as, a, as a graduate student there. And uh, my days in Palo Alto are, are still fond. And uh, so it's really good to be there. Next time I, I talk to a Stanford crowd, hopefully it will be in person so I can enjoy those Palo Alto days and the sunshine and the warmth. Uh, what I thought I would do today is, is just talk a little bit about what I'm seeing in terms of how the economy uh, has performed pretty much during the pandemic uh, and, and pr provide really a framework for thinking about what policy should look like going forward. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about what's happened over the past 12 months, uh, and then, then turn to policy at the back end. And then I'm really looking forward to the, the conversation uh, and, the, and the question and answer session. That's, that's oftentimes the most uh, fulfilling part of these type of talks uh, for the speaker as well as for the audience. So, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's really good to be here. Uh, when I, you know, when I think about the, the economic performance of uh, the last year, I think it's really important to start before the, the virus uh, hit us uh, and just remind people about where we were uh, in the very early months of 2020. Uh, the economy was growing moderately and, you know, the both, it was the longest uh, post-war period of growth that we had seen. We were into our 11th year of continuous expansion. Uh, but when people looked at the economy, job growth was slowing, uh, but it was still producing uh, jobs at a, at a much greater rate than is needed to absorb the new entrance into the economy. Uh, the labor force was growing and importantly, the unemployment rate for African-Americans and, and others who had been more uh, weakly attached to the economy had started to really move in a positive way. And we had started to see a, a reduction in the, in the employment gap between uh, white workers and, and African-American workers in the country. Uh, and this was really a positive thing. And you know, I think about a year ago, um, actually it's a year ago next week that we in, at, at the Atlanta Fed decided that we were going to shut the building down by and large and have people work remotely. But before that, you know, the idea of the virus being a problem uh, was still sort of a notional idea. And so when I, when I look back at some of the documents, you may know that the Fed uh, puts, uh, submits a monetary policy report to Congress uh, twice a year, every six months, and one of them, once in February and once in August. Uh, and I look back at the February report, and this is what we wrote. Uh, downside risks to the US outlook seem to have receded in the latter part of the year, which was the latter part of 2019. 
As the conflicts over trade policy diminished somewhat, economic growth abroad showed signs of stabilizing and financial conditions eased. And here's the last sentence. More recently, possible spillovers from the effects of the coronavirus in China have presented a new risk to the outlook. So uh, when we entered at this point like a year ago, uh, things were pretty solid. Uh, we were in a reasonably strong position. Uh, there were economic challenges for sure, but I don't think anybody really could appreciate uh, what the virus would bring to the economy. Uh, sadly, we've had numerous waves of the COVID uh, infection uh, wave uh, that has struck us. And we had to take public health responses to address that, uh, that, that challenge. And that then changed the economic outlook considerably and left us in a place where um, we had to shut down a lot of businesses and we saw historic economic contractions. Now, we at the Fed, we acted quickly. And I, I have to say, I was very pleased that Chair Powell provided tremendous leadership in uh, having us take steps to keep financial markets functioning. Uh, we lowered the Fed funds rate. We opened a bunch of facilities and really provided a backstop for, for many financial markets. And by and large, they worked. But at the same time, there was tremendous economic disruption. Uh, GDP, gross dom domestic product, fell by 10% in the first half of 2020, uh, which is a sharper downturn than we saw in the Great Recession. And headline employment uh, sp spiked to a 14.8% level in April, which was the worst reading since World War II. Now, it wasn't clear how we were gonna respond. It was, it's, very, it's very interesting. In our textbooks, in my textbooks at Stanford, we didn't have a chapter on pandemic responses. So we really did need to just let things happen and, and really be ready to respond as necessary. Uh, and we were, I was pleased to see that economic activity responded very, very nicely uh, in the late spring and early summer. Uh, states and localities eased restrictions and people and businesses really adapted to the, the COVID reality. Uh, we saw lots of job growth uh, and uh, we saw that a lot of people came back into the workforce. Now, unfortunately, we didn't keep the virus under control. And when that happened in the fall, uh, we saw that the, the momentum that we had before uh, really diminish uh, as people uh, retrenched. They reduced their spending on services like restaurants and going to theaters and movies and other activities that involve large gatherings. Now, all of this is summarized on slide one. So I would ask that we uh, show the first slide just to, to demonstrate uh, what uh, we're talking about. So the, not the next one. And what you'll see on the, the next slide, which is the chart, uh, is that um, you saw the big drop in spending in, in March and April. Uh, and then you see the, the, the recovery and, and the upward growth in that recovery is really significant. Uh, and then you see toward the end of, of, of the year in, in September, October, and November, uh, things leveling off uh, and actually declining in some instances, um, that corresponds directly to uh, the, the re-emergence of the virus as a problem. One thing to note here is that the patterns of spending and the recovery did not have it happen evenly. I'll talk more about this, but spending by households really shifted to buy things rather than to buy services, like concrete things for in the home and, and likewise. Now, if you think about all of last year, all of 2020, GDP declined by 2.5%, 2.5%. That's not as bad as many expected. Uh, but even with that, uh, payroll employment in January was almost 10 million jobs below what we saw uh, in those months just before the pandemic hit. And the unemployment rate uh, remained at, at a, is about 6.3%, which is pretty high. Now, we just had a job support today. Uh, it was a very positive one. But even with that, the number of jobs short that we face is about 9.5 million, 9.5 million jobs. Uh, that's a large number. Now, I will also say that that doesn't tell the whole story in terms of the, the damage to the labor market, uh, as a lot of people dropped out of the economy, uh, dropped out of the labor force, and we lost about four and a half million people exiting the labor force for that reason as well. Now, surveys, we, we, we really tried to dig into this, and surveys and other data have told us that there are three reasons why people have dropped out of the labor force. One is that they're, they've been really afraid that they're going to get sick. And that's a serious concern. The second is uh, there's been a degree of hopelessness that has emerged in the sense that 
if you're in particular sectors like restaurants or hotels or entertainment venues, uh, there are a number, what we've seen is that there, the workers there are starting to feel like those, those opportunities are not going to emerge again. And then third, and you may have seen stories on this, uh, many parents, particularly women, have been compelled to stay at home to take care of kids, uh, their children as schools have not been open and, and kids have had to do school from home. All of these are significant reasons uh, why the labor force participation rate is much lower. And if you take those people into account with the basic unemployment rate, what you get is an aggregate broader unemployment picture that's around 10%, which is pretty high and, and it rivals sort of what we saw at the, at the worst periods of the Great Recession. Now, because the, the nature of this, uh, this recession and this crisis is quite different, there's a real issue about to what extent is the disruption that we're seeing a function of, uh, or things that are gonna be permanent or gonna remain temporary. And the two areas where I worry about this a lot is one is healthy small businesses pre-virus um, not being able to survive the COVID period. So we lose businesses that were viable. Uh, and then the second is to see uh, this labor force participation drop become permanent where people leave the, the, the labor force and the workforce completely. Now, this is the basic story. That's the top line picture of what we have. Uh, but the one thing I did wanna say, and it's an important thing to keep in mind as we consider policy moving forward, is that there is a signature characteristic of our pandemic, pandemic driven economic crisis. And that is the unevenness of impact. Now, when I talk about the economy and the, the nature of the recovery, you know, I've, re I've referred to it as something of a less than recovery, where less than refers to a less than, less than sign that you would have in math, you know, that, that, that sideways V that, that shows that uh, some parts go up and other parts go down. Now on the upward slope of that less than symbol, uh, we have a number of uh, occupations and professions. We have uh, service providers that, uh, that provide goods for the home. You think about Home Depot, you think about you know, Amazon, uh, those sorts of companies that are well positioned to serve the needs that you would see uh, in a, a, a large work from home posture. And you also have people that work in businesses uh, that are able to work at home. So if, if you had workers that were able to work from home, then they can continue to produce, they can continue to provide uh, their value add to the economy and continue to grow moving forward. Now, we also have on the bottom side, uh, a bunch of businesses and business sectors where uh, they require people to come together. And what we've seen is that those, those sectors have taken uh, the biggest hits and they've had the slowest recoveries. Now, we can show this on the next slide uh, where we look at uh, employment by occupation over this, time, over this time period. And what you see here, uh, the blue line shows that, uh, that, that people working in low-skilled jobs, and low-skilled jobs is a term that is used in, in sort of the academic research. You should think about it as jobs in the traditional service sector. Uh, they had the biggest job losses, and you see they started to re recover and rebound pretty strongly, uh, but that, that faltered in the winter and the fall as the virus uh, reemerged. And so for that segment of the economy, things have actually degraded pretty considerably uh, since the, the fall. Whereas if you had jobs in sort of a skill sector like management or professional services or in the trades, construction or production of those sorts of things, um, you pretty much let, leveled off and stabilized. Uh, I would note that since the virus has reemerged, uh, stabilization is the best we've seen. We've not seen a continued growth. And so it really does emphasize the point that this is a, a virus-driven uh, economy right now more than anything else. Now, I also thought it would be helpful to note that what we are, that what we are experiencing here in this, ex this recession is really quite different than what happens in most recessions. So if we go to the next slide, uh, what we show here is what happened in terms of where the job losses occurred in the Great Recession, which are the gray bars, as opposed to in the current recession, which are the orange bars. And what you will see here is that in the Great Recession, all, all the job loss or the, the great predominance of the job loss was in that middle skill segment. And if you looked at the low skill segment, 
Um, that's a negative number there. That means that jobs were, were actually grew. The number of jobs in that sector grew during the Great Recession. Now you contrast that with the current experience. We're in that low jobs uh, segment where, that where jobs were growing. Uh, we've seen a, a tremendous reversal. And the loss there has been uh, in terms of number of jobs at, at a level comparable to what we've seen in middle school, uh, the middle school job sector. This is a tremendous change. And it really means that the recovery and how we respond to the recovery is going to have to be different uh, than, than what we have seen and, and considered in previous uh, recessions. And we can also talk about this in terms of wage levels. And if you look at, if you think about where jobs have, have been lost, they've historically been lost uh, sort of in the middle of the distribution. Here again, people at the lowest end of the job of the, of the wage distribution have seen the, the greatest job loss. If you had, if you were in the top quarter of wage earners, uh, since February of last year, the, the amount of employment is down about 4%. If you're in the bottom part of the distribution, that bottom fourth, the number of jobs that have been lost is 17%, a tremendous difference in terms of this experience. Now, this, experience, this disparity also is true if you look at things by race. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we, we try to show this for you. Uh, this shows the, the, the percent of job losses uh, by uh, people of different ethnicities. And what we show here is that for, if you're a non-Hispanic white worker, uh, the number of jobs down is about four and a half percent. But if you're in any of the ethnic groups here, whether it be African-Americans or Hispanics or Asians, uh, the amount of job losses is, is much, much greater. Uh, and this is a, 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 just a, a, a truth and a fact of where we are. And I'll say one of my economists at our bank, Julie Hotchkiss, has done some research that suggests that this COVID recession has reversed has, and actually fully reversed the labor market process, progress of black Americans uh, that I mentioned was, was really occurring at the end of the great recession. So it's been devastating to African-American, uh, the African-American workforce. Uh, and it's something that we definitely have to keep in mind. Now, I will also say that um, research is uh, accumulating uh, that, that's really suggesting that in addition to just this unevenness, there are some structural changes that appear to be happening in the economy. Uh, and that the, many of the people who are losing jobs uh, that are in industries and like hospitality and, and food service, they may be in a place where um, those jobs are not gonna come back in the same numbers and they might need to, to learn new skills. And this could be difficult and costly uh, for those, those, those workers as well as for our, our economy. And a word that comes to mind in this is the word reallocation, which is a word that, that is, should be familiar to some of you at Stanford because uh, the, uh, uh, there is work that is being done by a Stanford professor in collaboration with us here at the Atlanta Fed, as well as professors from the University of Chicago. Uh, we put together a survey of business uncertainty where we survey businesses uh, consistently uh, to get a sense of what they're experiencing in terms of jobs and sales for, uh, for the future. And what their responses recently have suggested are things that really indicate that we're gonna have structural change. They're gonna sub substantially reduce their business travel even after the pandemic. That has significant implications for the labor market and the macro economy. But they're also expecting that the experiences that they've seen during this, this COVID pandemic are likely to continue. So if we, if we pull up the next chart, um, I'm going to, this chart shows some pictures uh, about what we mean, uh, what's happened in terms of what authors, what the authors call excess reallocation. Now, what I like to think of this as is really like a churn rate, like how experience is in terms of the amount of, uh, of performance in terms of hiring or uh, the sales that, that is happening above a long run average. And what we, what we show here is that the churn has increased dramatically since the pandemic. You see in sales, things have, the churn has doubled uh, since uh, 2020. Uh, and really what I take this as is a signal that the winners, uh, when they win, they're winning bigger. And those that are struggling are actually struggling harder relative to what was happening pre-pandemic. And this, this idea of the winners winning bigger really means that 
there's going to be a reallocation of labor and expenditure toward those sectors. Now, one key point that we get from this survey uh, that is not shown in the, in the chart, but I think is really critical to understand, is that the survey respondents are not expecting this churn to decline immediately. So the winners are going to continue to be the winners. And those that are struggling are going to continue to struggle, really consistent with our less than sign or our less than recovery narrative. And this is significant because if this holds for an extended period of time, uh, it really does suggest that uh, we're going to have to invest pretty significantly in helping workers uh, reskill themselves, uh, get out of those industries that are potentially not going to recover to the same extent. And that reality has really been a driving force for some of the things we've been doing uh, at our bank. We've, stand, we've stood up a Center for Workforce and Economic Opportunity. Uh, and you can see, you can find that uh, online. And what we've done through that is, is really try to identify uh, workforce development efforts that have worked and also form a number of partnerships uh, that are aimed at streamlining how the country, uh, country's workforce development system uh, works and, and try to, to get it to be much more functional and much more muscular so that we can uh, help workers that are in those industries that uh, may not be recovering robustly get to a new place. Uh, one thing I'd like to call out on this regard is the Rework America Alliance. It's a partnership we have with the Markle Foundation and major companies, uh, labor unions, public interest groups, and others. And what we're trying to do there is really at a local level, create uh, an ecosystem or an infrastructure that really is, established, is, is, is focused on uh, getting workers to be aware of where the job sectors that are growing are, as well as uh, aware of pathways to getting skills so they can be competitive in that area. It's those sorts of things that I think are very, very important and uh, will become more important, uh, particularly if uh, this churn continues and the split between the haves and the have-nots uh, co uh, continues to be at such a wide level. Now, with all that, there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot that's going on. I do have reasons to be optimistic. And, and one is that uh, because this, uh, of what's happening in the public health space, you know, as I've said, this is a public health problem first and foremost. We've seen labor markets respond to uh, how the virus has progressed. Uh, and so if we can get that virus contained, uh, then I think that we can uh, start to see recovery happen in a very robust way. Now, one thing that you should also, you should all recognize is that uh, the number of new COVID cases and hospitalizations has been falling. It's, it's fallen well uh, below where we were uh, in the December and early January period. And the pace of vaccinations is improving. If we can continue to go in that trajectory and enough of the public vaccinated uh, gets vaccinated, uh, then the recovery can occur in a very vigorous way because uh, the confidence that people have will be high and, the, and it, our ability to really get back to going to restaurants and doing all the things that happen when we uh, get together uh, will recover. Another thing I would say on, in this regard, and I've seen this uh, in the, the contacts that I've had with business leaders and with families, is that there's pent up demand to do a lot of things. Uh, many people who have been uh, well uh, fortunate enough to be able to continue working through the pandemic, they have resources and money to spend, their savings rates have gone up, uh, and because of the fiscal support and relief, there, is resource, there are resources that are available and people are really ready to, to use those resources to get back to some of the normal things that they've seen in their lives. And my staff and their canvassing of the economy is really starting to see evidence of this uh, recur return to high levels of demand. Uh, we've seen, we're seeing increased future bookings at resorts and, and restaurants. I saw a report the other day that uh, cruise lines are seeing uh, record bookings as well to really suggest that, that people are hungry to get out and be social. Uh, and that once they have sort of a green light to do that, uh, we might expect there to be pretty robust uh, economic activity and growth. Now, my baseline forecast for GDP growth is five to 6% in 2021. That is higher than where we've been uh, for many years, but I think that that is uh, a, a, not an unreasonable expectation. But even with that growth, uh, we won't back to, be back to pre-pandemic economic trajectories uh, I'm projecting until the second half of 2022. 
Now, all this really does assume that we don't have setbacks in terms of the virus or the vaccine distribution. Uh, if that happens, then the growth um, and our return to pre-pandemic levels uh, could uh, put, be pushed back. Now, so let me just close with a, a reflection on, on our policy. And I would just say, I think our stance is appropriate. And we definitely need to be continuing to provide robust support for the economy. And while some might look at the top line number and think that we're fine and that, we're, that, that our momentum is taking us to a place where uh, we are in a good place, I do think it's important to recognize and understand that this really does mask the, une the unevenness of experiences, as well as the reality that there remains considerable distress in our economy. And in many communities, that level of distress rivals the distress that we saw during the Great Recession. So I always get asked sort of, when are you gonna move? Like, uh, like when, when should we expect you to, to change your policies? I would just say there are three things that I would point to. One is really how fast we re return to uh, uh, full employment. And that's one of our mandates. We're a long way from that today. We're nine and a half million jobs short of where we were pre-pandemic. And not just in, and the issue here is not just in terms of the numbers, but also the character of job loss. Now I have one more slide to show, which I'm gonna put up here. Uh, and this really does speak to the, the character of that job loss. Um, what you see here is that, and I want you to focus on that, that, uh, that, that blue area in the top, but that is the number of workers or the share of our, our employment um, that is for people who have been out of work 27 weeks or more. That is a long time. And all economic research really suggests that if you're out of work that long, it is difficult or more difficult for you to get reattached to the economy. So when we have that kind of dynamic, it's going to be important that we don't forget those people uh, and make sure that, that we do all we can to make sure that they can get reattached. Clearly inflation is important. Uh, right now it's difficult to tease out uh, a real signal of underlying inflation, uh, but we have to always be mindful about what's happening uh, with the price level. And then the third thing I wanted to point to is that we're gonna be guided or I'll be guided by our long run monetary policy framework. Um, this framework, we adopted a new one in August and it says we're gonna allow the economy to run hotter than, than we might otherwise, because when that's happened, we have not seen uh, it be accompanied by spikes of inflation, which might suggest that the economy is overheating. Given that reality, I think I'll be comfortable letting the economy run hot uh, and let, let inflation actually get above 2% for some time. 2% is our target um, before I really show any sorts of concern. And, and on that, that point, you know, we've been below 2% for a long time. And so the question is sort of how much or how long would you expect to be above the 2% moving forward? For me, I think I'm comfortable being above 2% for quite a while, as long as the trajectory of inflation above 2% uh, is not uh, one that seems to be spiraling away from that, that anchor. So as long as that's happening, I think that, that uh, we can continue to provide some ample and strong support for the economy. And, and I won't be too troubled by that. The last thing I would just say is uh, we're ready and able, and I think you saw this at the very beginning of the crisis, uh, to support the recovery as long and as, as strongly as necessary. Underlying all our work is really that we need to do all we can to minimize the long-term damage from the pandemic crisis uh, and work to make sure that the recovery is as broad-based and as inclusive as possible. So let me stop there, uh, Mark. We want to come back and let's have a little conversation. That's great. Uh, thanks so much, Raf. That was uh, so uh, interesting and packed with tons of information. <clears throat> and I have a, a lot of great questions from the audience, but I'm going to ask you uh, some of my own first. And we'll start with, there's a lot of weighty questions that, I, that I'll ask, but let's start with a fun one. So you've moved to Atlanta pretty recently, and I'm curious, as a sports fan, have you yet become a Braves or a Falcons or a Hawks fan? So the short answer is no. <laughs> and you know, you know what? So you know, I have my own history. So, uh, so in baseball, I'm, the, I'm a Mets fan. So Mets and Braves, they don't really get along so well. Uh, and then the Falcons, I'm a Dolphins fan. Don't ask how that happened. There's a whole thing on that. And then for the Hawks, I'm a Sixers fan. I grew up in South Jersey near Philadelphia. So, and, and I'm I'm pretty hardcore in the sense of once I have a team, that's my team. So uh, I own, I'm owning my history, and you know, the folks here have. have come to terms with that. 
Okay, very interesting. Um, I want to hear the dolphin story sometime as a as a patriot person. But um, anyway, oh, um, so yes. as and the timing today for your presentation is really perfect because uh, at least for me, because in my uh, Ecom One class this morning, just before this, we've been we started talking about monetary policy, um, and you know I talked about the different regions, um, and you know you one of the twelve regions is is that you cover is the. Atlanta Fed region. And so I'm curious, as, as a president of the Atlanta Fed, how do you see the differences across the country in terms of employment and output and other economic measures? So, you know, it's very interesting. Um, every district has its own character. And if I had to characterize the sixth district, I'm in the, the south, the greater southeast of so Florida, Georgia, Alabama, parts of Tennessee, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Are the economies of that district really mirrors the U.S. economy in terms of the, the, the range of activities and the size of those particular activities. So we're not heavily driven by finance or by energy or by tech. We have the proportions that you see uh, you know, across the entire country. But the one thing I would also say is that within our district, we see a lot of variation. So we have tourist, tourist locations. We have Miami and New Orleans and Orlando. Um, we have a large military presence. We have manufacturing. Uh, we do have energy in Louisiana uh, and, and out into the Gulf. So we're really a microcosm for the whole economy. I think it's, it's very help, helpful for me in terms of getting a sense of the big picture about what's going on. That's great. Okay, thanks so much. And so, uh, and this is interesting because out here in California, we have, we're at or near the top in terms of unemployment rate. I don't know if you call it a top or bottom, but there's, uh, <laughs> there's been, it's, it's been uh, kind of a struggle out here economically for us. We're not alone, Hawaii, Nevada, been hit pretty hard too. But um, so I want to ask now about some, the long-term effects from the pandemic. And you touched on this a little bit, but I just want to try to drill down a little deeper on this. What changes do you think will happen to the economy? Which industries and workers will win and who will, uh, who will lose in the long run? You know, it's, it's, it, this is a question that we, we continually ask, and it's, it's actually very interesting. You know, I think one area where we've got it, we're going to see a, a, a large amount of change is where work gets done. Uh, I know for us, we are really wrestling with the question of how many of our workers do we need to have in the building on a regular basis, or, or how many can just work from home, or, or are we going to have some sort of hybrid situation? That is a, a, the conversation that's happening in companies all over the country. And the answers to that will, will have large implications for things like, uh, like office space, commercial real estate, um, how you think about investments in capital. So businesses investments in computers and technology to allow people to, to communicate. Um, and also, you, know, you look at, at businesses like, like the Amazons and, and the, the services that bring goods to the house, those will all be important. I also think about the flip side and businesses finding ways to deliver their services uh, from a, more of a remote posture. I look at hospitals, for example. Um, some hospitals in our some hospital systems in, in our district, when we talked to them, they said pre-pandemic, only 3% of our patient contacts were through telehealth. Now we're at almost a third are through telehealth. And that has real implications for you know, what they need in terms of their space, but also in terms of the supportive activities that happen around a hospital. You may not need as much in terms of a parking deck or in terms of restaurants or in terms of flowers and the like, because people won't be coming in nearly as much. Uh, and so that cascading will, will uh, play out in a pretty significant way. I think those are also interesting. And then the other one I would, I would say is um, we, we've heard from a number of of businesses, take restaurants, for example, um, that they're rethinking how they integrate technology into their businesses. And that can have real implications for the types of jobs that uh, they need. For example, uh, the use of a, a tablet to order or, or ordering remotely uh, means that they may not need as many workers on, on site. Uh, and those sorts of issues are also being uh, wrestled with across the board. So I, I think this, then that really is part of that churn, that, that reallocation I was talking about, uh, that you're, we're gonna see a number of these uh, industries that may continue to, to operate, need different kinds of workers and different numbers of workers 
Uh, and uh, I think there will be some, some segments that emerge, uh, but there are gonna be others that, that probably won't come back. Great, thanks for that. Uh, next question has to do with sort of thinking about retraining workers. So the economy is clearly changing a lot and you very eloquently uh, displayed that and, and, and described that just a, mo a few moments ago, but um, how will, what will this do to the need to retrain workers throughout the course of their careers? And, and um, so yeah, curious about your thoughts on that. Well, you know, when I was growing up, it used to be the case that people expected they would have one job, it would be in a, in a company plant and they would pretty much do something similar to what they were doing for their entire work career. Uh, and that started breaking down. And I think what we've gotten to now is that it's completely broken down. And the, there isn't an expectation that you're gonna be at the same place for a long time, or even that you'll have the same type of job for a long time. And what that means, the phrase is lifelong learning or, or, or reskilling or however you, you wanna talk about it, uh, that is becoming more important. And that will, I think, is gonna become the way that we live and operate. And what that will mean is that uh, we are going to need to have a retraining infrastructure, a workforce development infrastructure uh, that facilitates that because the numbers that we're talking about are just gonna be greater and the, the skill shifts that, we're, that we need are going to be larger than what we've seen historically. And so if we just leave this to each individual worker to figure this out, uh, my fear is that it's gonna take far longer than, we, than is optimal for us to see workers find the right jobs, get those skills and allow us to continue to be productive. So I actually think that um, this, is, this, this is one of the key issues uh, as we think about uh, the economy moving forward and us collectively maintaining our standard of living. We've got to make sure that every worker in America is engaged. Great, thanks very much for that. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about, and you, and you uh, touched on this a bit in your, in your slides, is uh, differences in the sort of income and corresponding wealth gap between different races uh, in the US. I'm curious, you know, as, as a president of a, uh, one of the 12 uh, Fed, Federal Reserve banks, what role do you think the Federal uh, Reserve System should play in mitigating the wealth and income gap between uh, different races? And are there other systemic issues that the Fed can help mitigate? Yeah, so I, I've been fairly out, outspoken on this. I actually do think that the, the Fed does have a role to play here. Uh, and in part, it's with the things that we do directly. So I think our policies can be important to help uh, reduce the employment gap in particular, which can allow African-Americans and Latinos and others to have jobs that pay them uh, living wages uh, and it gives it, puts positions them to actually start to build wealth. Because if you don't have a job, it's hard to, to actually become wealthy. And so you got to start there. And we know historically there have been large gaps. And this is one of the reasons why we changed the long run monetary framework to acknowledge that you know, our monetary policy has a role to play in making sure that everyone has a chance to be included in our economy uh, and, and prosper and, and be productive. Now, the other reality is that many of the gaps that exist are due to things and long-term policies that we don't have direct uh, control over. But to me, I think that just says that we still need to call them out and bring others into the conversation to see that, that those who do have an ability to, to shape things uh, are thinking about that. So we, for example, have uh, stood up a Racism in the Economy series, webinar series, I hope uh, all of our viewers are aware of this. If you aren't, you can Google racism in the economy, Federal Reserve, and you'll see that we've had four segments on this. And in each of these, we've talked about um, structural racial barriers uh, that have prevented African-Americans and Native Americans and Latinos and Asian Americans uh, from fully participating in aspects of our economy. And that's holding us all back collectively. So because we have an interest in having our economy be as strong and as robust as possible, I think we do have an interest in talking about these issues to try to get these barriers reduced or removed so that uh, we can be collectively more productive and more resilient uh, and more innovative and entrepreneurial. So I think this is an important thing for us to do. And because we are, um, you know, we're a more neutral arbiter, we're, we're not gonna benefit personally. I'm not gonna get rich from this. Um, I think we have an opportunity 
to really lift up the things that work and, and get traction in the policy space. Great, thanks very much for that. Um, and to some extent related to this, um, so you are unfortunately too rare an example of an African-American PhD economist. And I'm curious, uh, this is something that's very much on our minds, uh, in, I think in the economics profession generally and here at Stanford for sure too. What do you think are the best things that we at Stanford and elsewhere within the economics profession and academia can do to increase interest and success among African-American, Hispanic, and uh, students from other underrepresented minority groups in PhD programs and beyond? You know, Mark, the, I like the way you asked the question because you really talked about interest first. And we have to make sure that, that you know, African-Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, women as well, um, are actually interested in it. And you know, one of the concerns I have is that too often uh, people in those, those categories are getting negative reinforcement early in their, their lives uh, about their ability uh, to participate in this and, and that aren't getting exposed in ways that are positive. So I think that's a first step. You know, what we're doing at our bank is uh, we, we're starting an initiative where we are putting together curricula on this for fifth graders and for eighth graders. We're starting super as early as we can to try to create an environment where by the time they get to uh, senior year in high school, they already know that they can do this stuff and they are interested in it enough so that when they get to, to the Stanford's uh, and the USC's and, and, and wherever, uh, Georgia Tech's or, or wherever you wanna talk about, um, econ is on the list of things that they might wanna explore. We gotta do that first. Then once we get people to college, uh, we need to make sure that there's an environment around them that, uh, that makes it clear that we want them to be there, that we wanna support them uh, and that their perspective is, is, is valuable and interesting for us. Uh, I think that's a, an important second part. We know that for African-Americans and, and others, um, that first year in college, the second year in college, if you're first generation, those are extremely hard years and you can feel isolation in a way that uh, will lead you to not to, to withdraw and not engage. And then we lose those kids. We need to make sure that we are uh, really attentive and purposeful and intentional that we're gonna keep people uh, and that we're gonna wrap around them the, uh, uh, an infrastructure so they can really let their talents blossom. And I think that's gonna be an important uh, thing that, that everyone has to think about. Wonderful. Thanks so much for that, Raf. And just this is going to be my final question. Then I have a ton from the audience. So I've got some great ones, but I have a, a personal incentive to get a good answer for this one. So I'm teaching my <laughs> Ecom One students right now about monetary policy next week. And what are the two things you would most like for me to make sure to mention to them when I talk about the Fed beyond the standard, you know, things I might otherwise neglect to mention? Um, yeah. So one thing is, you know, the Fed is more than just monetary policy. And you know, we do uh, bank regulation, and we also do a fair amount of outreach into communities to try to uh, really help them overcome their barriers. I think people are not as aware of the wide range of things uh, that the Federal Reserve does and the ways that it touches people. Uh, and then this, the second thing I think I would say is, um, and is related, is that you know, we are trying as much as possible uh, to understand um, the, the barriers to success and, and what sorts of things are needed uh, for our economy to continue to grow and to continue to be a leader. Uh, and that is things around innovation and productivity uh, and um, industrial organization, uh, the, like the how that the economy works uh, so that we can really have a, a, a better sense of, of what uh, our policies are likely to do as they um, diffuse through the economy. Okay, terrific. Thanks very much. And I've, I've got this written down for uh, from Monday, Monday, 10 a.m. So this is <laughs> this is terrific. So uh, so a lot of great questions from the audience, and I doubt I'll be able to get to all of them. But let me start off with this one. Uh, do you think the Fed will be able to remove some of the stimulus from the economy without any negative effects? Um, boy, that's a hard question. Uh, so uh, I'm hope I'm hopeful that that will be the case. You know what I, what I expect and, and hope is that uh, by the time we get to the place where uh, removal of our accommodation starts, uh, the economy will be very close to uh, full employment. Uh, our 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 growth will be robust. 
Uh, and there will be a lot of confidence collectively about uh, how the economy is likely to perform moving forward, which should translate into the economy can stand on its own without needing that, 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 that support. To the extent that that happens, I think we can really pull back and not see a lot of adverse uh, impacts on the economy. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're gonna try to, to, uh, to affect as, as we uh, move forward over the next couple of years. Great, thanks for that. Um, and then uh, getting a little more potentially into the fiscal policy arena, how worried are you about the ballooning deficit and corresponding debt, potentially rising interest rates, making the deficit even worse? Well, you know, you have to be worried about uh, the deficit and you have to be worrying about debt. I guess for me, I think we have a short run problem that we have to deal with first, and that is getting through the, this pandemic and making sure that uh, the damage that has been, uh, that has occurred does not become a large scale permanent kind of damage. Well, you know, all, I think about all the relief as trying to pr provide a bridge for families and businesses. So when we get to the other side, they're as close to where they were pre-pandemic as possible. If that happens, then our growth can be robust. But if we don't take care of that bridge and a lot of families and businesses fall through, uh, the damage and the pain that they're gonna be in is gonna be a lot greater and the hole we will have to get out of will be that much deeper. So for me, I, I wanna make sure we do as, as good as we can on the short run problem. Uh, and then that should position us to be better at addressing the, the longer run problem, which is the deficit and the debt. Um, we're, I, th I do think there's going to have to be a reckoning on that eventually, but that's a couple pages down in the book. Right now, we have to really take care of where we are today. Okay, thanks for that. Um, somewhat related to this is uh, a question, what type of multiplier would you apply to the $1.9 trillion stimulus? Many economists, don't think it will have the desired effect because so much of it uh, will be saved. So um, in part, this depends on the, the distribution of the, the funds. So some of it will go to families that will use it to, to delever, right? So they'll take the funds and they'll pay down some of their debt so they're positioned in a, in a stronger position moving forward. Some of it will be used by families that really do have immediate real-time needs in terms of their housing and in terms of food and in terms of clothing. You know, one of the things that's been very interesting uh, through this pandemic, because of the relief, I believe, we've not seen an eviction crisis. We've not seen foreclosures that, that have spiked. When I talk to, to lenders, you know, they tell me that their mortgage portfolios are performing very solidly. And even families that were in forbearance programs, um, they're paying as, 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 uh, as expected on time. So I think that there's that, but there are other components here. Some of it is, some of the funds are, are gonna be devoted as I understand it to vaccine distribution. That's hugely important. And to the extent that that happens in a robust way, um, that's gonna mean that we start seeing things recover faster. Uh, some of it will go to help state and local governments uh, who have suffered because there hasn't been sales taxes uh, and other revenues, and they will then be able to support the, the distribution of the vaccine in a, in a more robust way as well. So I do think some of these have a way to, to flow through uh, that are indirect uh, and could lead to uh, and contribute to more acceleration. But for an exact multiplier, I don't have a number for you, but I, you know, I do think it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not zero. Great, thanks, Raphael. Um, next question has to do with aging populations in the US and around the world. Um, that they've caused the growth of working age adults to essentially flatten or even decline in some countries. And this might suggest lower economic potential going forward and may limit the stimulative impact of lower interest rates. <clears throat> Is there much that the Fed or any central bank can do to promote given this backdrop? Or, uh, and this is from the question, is Larry Summers right? And Ben Bernanke's speech at AEA last January rep represented the last hurrah of central bankers. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I, I don't think we're dead yet. So I'll just, I'll just say that. You know, and what I would say is, if you look at what's happened through the pandemic, I think our positioning from policy has been incredibly important in providing a sense of stability 
and a, and a backstop that is uh, really important for um, for how the economy has performed. And so, so the presence and the existence of the central bank has been has been very important. Uh, I do think, though, that you know the, the monetary policy is not the only policy out there, and we are not all powerful to accomplish all things. And if you think about sort of the aging of the population and keeping our workers productive, that's going to require investments in technology and other things so that our workers can continue to be pr productive or even increase their productivity on a per person basis. And so, you know, we, we are going to need to have all the, 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 um, the levers of policy engaged in this. Uh, and this is an important uh, consideration moving forward. Okay, great. Thanks so much for that. Um, one of the things I think you may know about this that we take a lot of pride in here at Stanford is our uh, summer institute for high school teachers to equip them to hopefully help them teach uh, their, their students who are taking economics better. And I have a question here, I believe, possibly from, from one of those teachers. Um, I'm a teacher and I was discussing with my students the new framework that the Fed is adopting to help narrow the racial economic gap. And one of my students asked this question, and I was hoping you could address it. How will this reform hold up against a large segment of labor workers being substituted by, by AI and technology? Uh, will there be any protection in favor of these racially diverse workers against outsourcing to other countries and of course, you know, automation? So that's a, that's a complicated question. There's a lot in there. Um, here's what I would say. You know, I've been doing a bit of canvassing of our district to try to understand what the introduction of technology will mean for, uh, for jobs and the availability of jobs. And uh, in many instances, when I, when I talk to, to leaders and businesses that have factories or production centers where they are automating, what they tell me is that um, even though the old jobs go away, there are new jobs that emerge. And in some instances, in many instances, the numbers are comparable. Uh, the challenge we have is that the skills required for those new jobs are very, very different than the skills that are required for the old jobs. And that takes us back to the job retraining uh, issue. Um, this question is actually very insightful because I'm not asked the question exactly that way. But one of the things that, that I do know is that, you know, employers are sensitive to the fact that they have a, a, a workforce uh, and that they don't want to just and some instances just leave them by the wayside. And so, you know, I've talked to some employers who uh, have started retraining programs for their own workers to give them a first dibs on the new jobs moving forward. But I think this is a larger issue uh, that, that really merits uh, more conversation. So it's a very, very good question. And it's really on the cutting edge of, I think, how uh, the economy is evolving. Great. Uh, thanks for that, Raf. Uh, Another question coming in from a different angle on a different issue. Uh, so while the Board of Governors of the Fed is appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate, the presidents of the 12 regional banks are appointed by a group of private sector representatives. Regular Americans don't have a seat at the table in regard to leadership of their regional Federal Reserve, despite the fact that the Fed makes decisions that strongly influence their personal finances. Given this, as a regional bank president, do you think the president regional president appointment process should be reformed, and if so, how? Well, I, I'm actually not going to agree with the oh, the the opening premise. I actually do think that you know every president and, and the operation of the Federal Reserve banks uh, is predicated on the notion that we are uh, organizations that are in, informed by. Uh, that are governed by and that are um, overseen by um, the broader economy and our, our society. You know, I spend a lot of time going around talking to, uh, to locals and I'm account I feel accountable to them. Our performance is, is really uh, determined by how our economy performs. And that's, that's communities, that's firms, that's families, it's everybody. So, so I think that the notion that, um, that we just sit, at, sit at somewhere else and, and make some judgments without feeling accountable or engaging with, uh, with regular people, I don't think that's true. Now, I do think that we don't talk about this nearly enough. Uh, and this is one of the things that 
uh, emerged actually in one of the Racism in the Economy series discussions about the Beige Book, which is you know, our, our regular uh, reporting out of the reserve banks of what we're seeing in the economy. Uh, we don't often articulate uh, how much we engage with a diversity of, of uh, slices of the broader economy. Uh, and um, we are doing those things. So Mark, that might be another thing that you add when you talk about the Fed, that, that, that we do actually try to be informed by a wide diversity of voices and perspectives in thinking about what appropriate policy should look like. That's great. I'm gonna write that down right after I ask this next question for you. And this is a question from a former classmate of yours from your PhD days. Um, I'm in trouble uh, now. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Does the Federal Reserve worry about the stock market as much as people seem to think? So I should answer this question uh, short. No. Uh, um, look, our mandates are maximum employment and price stability. And you know, I try to stay really focused on that. The stock market can give at, at times a signal that there may be uh, some risk taking that we need to pay attention to. But ultimately, um, our measures are, are what they are, and we're going to stay focused on that. Um, and that's, that's particularly important today. You know, the stock market is going one direction. And if you look at the employment prospects, we're nine and a half million jobs short. Uh, so, you know, in the, in the, that, given that choice, I'm going to focus on the nine and a half million jobs and try to make sure that we do all we can to get those back. Excellent. Uh, now I've got I've, I've got a ton of questions, so I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. But let me just try to. And I apologize if you asked a great question and I didn't get to it. I apologize. There's been a lot of great ones. So, next question here: All of your colleagues at the Fed have been asked a variation of the yield curve control or operation twist question. Their responses have generally been: There's no need for the Fed to respond to rising bond yields at this juncture. Do you concur with this sentiment? Do you believe there's a middle ground, such as strengthening forward guidance, to make it clear the Fed? would take uh, measures to keep long-term rates low in support of the economic expansion. So I'm pretty much where my colleagues are on this. You know, inflation has not been uh, a real stress point in terms of the economic performance for, for quite a long time. And um, the signals that I'm getting right now are, don't suggest that, that that has changed. So I'm pretty much where, where my colleagues are on that. Um, but we continue to, to monitor, you know, our, our, our bank right pre-pandemic had just uh, developed sort of a, an inflation dashboard to, to really measure and monitor and report out all the a various a variety of measures of inflation, uh, because we want people to know that we do think about this. Um, but right now, we're not, I don't feel like we're in a, in a crisis point. Uh, terrific. Uh, and we're, we're getting close to being out of time. I'm going to try to get one, possibly uh, two more questions uh, in. But uh, another question is, has the Fed factored in any additional political risks in 2021-22? So, so first of all, I got to speak for me. I can't speak for the whole Fed. But I would say you know, what we try to do and what I instruct our team to do is, is pay attention to what we're hearing out in the field. If businesses are concerned about political risk and it's changing and affecting their, their behavior, we have to take that on board. If families are doing the same thing, we have to take that on board. I do think right now uh, the risk is, is focused heavily on what's happening in terms of viral progression. That is the dominant risk uh, that we have right now. And uh, it looks like the relief package will go through. That uncertainty is receding. Uh, and so that's really where the political space comes in, in terms of how I'm trying to understand where we should be and how the economy is going to progress. Okay, great. Uh, one last question is, and I, I, you sort of touched on this a bit earlier, but maybe you can just uh, revisit it if you didn't quite uh, get to, can monetary policy address the disparate effects of the COVID related downturn on low skilled jobs? Uh, monetary policy alone can't, can't solve that. But one of the things that we have tried to do is, is use our resources to really put a spotlight on those effects and try to get that information in front of policymakers who can do uh, things more aggressively. So we started up a, a survey uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic focused on lower income communities and minority communities where, where we were starting to see those impacts. 
And as we've gotten feedback in that survey about sort of the nature of pain and the, the duration, the expected duration of that pain, we try to get in front of policymakers and say, look, this is important. And as you think about your relief packages, try to craft some policies to acknowledge that and to take that into account so that uh, we don't leave those communities behind. Because uh, as I said before, anyone who's left behind where this becomes permanent, um, that's extra stuff we're gonna have to do um, in the long run moving forward. Terrific. Um, and it uh, looks like we are at one o'clock and I so wish we had uh, some more time, uh, but I'm afraid that we unfortunately need to wrap things up. I'm so excited to share this with my uh, Ecom One students. I, I think they're going to benefit enormously from it. And, and, and Raphael, this was such a fantastic presentation and discussion. And it was really generous of you to take the time to be with us here today, especially with all that's happening in the world. Uh, this also brings us to an end of the main session of this year's CEPR Economic Summit. And I just want to thank everyone so much for participating, our panelists, our keynote speakers, and everyone who participated by sending in comments and watching, really made this an amazing event. Um, and I also want to give a very, 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 very special thank you to the amazing staff at CEPR, uh, every person who worked so hard to make this happen under such challenging circumstances. I'm incredibly grateful for all of their hard work. Um, and now if you've registered for our exclusive CEPR Associates sessions, there's one more place for you to go in just a few minutes. I'll be having a conversation with John Taylor to talk some more about macroeconomic policy. And you can join us for that session on the Summit event platform. So again, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Raf, for joining us all the way from Atlanta today. And I hope that we can do this next year in person and that we'll be able to see you in person sometime soon. Thanks so much. All right, take care. Thank you.